Hello, YouTube watcher. Welcome back to the series. In today's video, I'll be reading three letters written by people who had a connection to Chris, two of whom seek to understand what happened, and the third went on to become Chris's prison girlfriend. I'll be doing things a little differently today by making a few comments ahead of each letter. Mark from Washington, D.C. This reporter happened across a photo of Chris that a mutual friend posted on Facebook. Like so many, he's hoping there's a story to tell, perhaps an unknown side to the story that led to the murders. But Chris doesn't talk to the media, possibly a tip he picked up from prison pal Hannah from episode two. He stated that he just tears up any letters from the media. He doesn't trust that they will tell his self-serving narrative. Dear Chris, we haven't met before, but you went to high school with a good friend, Mitch. He posted a photo on Facebook yesterday of you and him together, part of three couples attending your high school prom. That made me want to reach out since we have someone we know in common. I've been a reporter for 20 years and Mitch knows I'm someone deeply committed to telling a person's story as completely as possible. I've won a Peabody Award for the investigation into the death of a Minnesota sailor in Iraq and got answers for that sailor's family when no one else would. Those are the types of stories I do. I cannot imagine what's going through your mind these past few days. I'm sure it seems like a long way from prom, but I firmly believe everyone has a story and a side to tell. My dad's family is from Colorado, and we drive out there from California every summer when I was a kid. I know the area well, so if you decide to receive visitors, I'd like to come out and chat, or feel free to correspond via mail or call collect if you feel more comfortable. I look forward to talking more. Mark. David from Frederick, Colorado. It appears David was a very good friend of Chris or at least who he thought Chris was. He was blindsided and is clearly struggling to understand how such a thing could have happened and what he could have done to prevent it. Did he know about the affair, the lies, and the plans made leading up to the murders? My guess is he did not. It must be hard for this man, a father himself, to reconcile the murders. And who knows what he chooses to believe to justify his past and possibly ongoing friendship with Chris. I hope he realizes that you can't separate the man from the crime, especially one as heinous as this one. Chris, I'm writing you this letter to possibly come visit. A lot of people are very curious and confused, but I'm much more than that. You are a good friend, and I really thought you could have come to talk to me. I've been through divorce and tough relationships in the past. I really could have helped you, I think. Per our conversation on August 13th at your house, on that night, I totally understood your situation. Well, at least what I thought was your situation. I know Shanann was hard on you, and so did everybody else. But dude, you could have done a thousand things different. I know you are probably reflecting on this by now, but still, it tore me up to think you couldn't reach out. The CBI came to my work to interview me. I told them how great of a dude you are. You would help anybody and were a great father. I also told them how overbearing Shanann could be and that there is no way you had anything to do with their disappearance. People were saying from your TV interviews, that guy is guilty. I would stand up for you and say, you don't know Chris. He has always been a mild-mannered guy. Come to think of it, I don't ever remember you getting mad, yelling, cussing, or anything. I do remember watching you take the girls in their wagon up and down the street. Caden says he remembers riding his bike and would stop and talk to you. He always said, Chris is so nice, Dad. Ellie did like to babysit for you guys as well. Annie was completely on your side as well, buddy. Chris, I always liked talking sports and cars with you and still remember the first day we met. 
I was happy to see another guy from the South that loved the ACC. Hell, I was excited to tell you about the land I just bought down in Florida, and you guys, especially you, were always invited. We helped each other move into the neighborhood and became, I think, good friends. I know both families were very busy, and time was hard to find sometimes, but I would have always made time for you. Seriously, dude. I would have, and I hope you know that. This is part of why I'm writing you today. I called the Weld County Sheriff's Office, and they said I need to write a letter to you to get on a visitor list with your approval. I know you think the world probably hates you, and honestly, I think most do. But there are some of us that know the real Chris Watts and would like to come see you. In closing, my friend, I'm still confused and upset about this tragic event. Annie and I flew to North Carolina for the funeral. I can tell you it was very well done, and believe it or not, peaceful. And even though we went to pay respects, I could not stop thinking of you the entire time. We even went to Fayetteville not realizing that was your hometown. We went to visit a few things like the Special Operations Museum. Being I was in that world for many years, I wanted to go see it. Well, enough said, I guess. But I hope you would like to chat and want to see me as a visitor. I am not judging you or anything like that. God bless, my friend, and wish you as well as can be expected. David. Anna from De Pere, Wisconsin. For those of you who don't know, Anna wrote to Chris while he was in Colorado and eventually became his girlfriend when he was transferred to Wisconsin, where she resides. Apparently, she had hoped he would be transferred closer to her. Could it have been due to the power of prayer? Her letter clearly caught Chris's attention. Here was someone who had also messed up, and she provides a message of hope through her faith in God and without the fangirl or pick-me vibes. She appeared authentic. But in a follow-up video I will be creating this weekend on his relationship with Anna, you will see how she influenced him in ways that prevent him from taking responsibility for his actions. Chris, my name is Anna, and first I want you to know that this is not a hate letter. I'm not writing this to condemn you or anything like that. I actually wanted to write for the exact opposite reason and let you know that no matter what the world says and no matter what you hear from other people, there is a God who loves you unconditionally and without judgment. I've been following your case, and it's been heavy on my heart to tell you that no matter what happens, or what has happened, God has already forgiven and forgotten about your sins. It's hard to accept that for me sometimes, to know that when I do something wrong in sin, I don't have to worry about him hanging it over my head and reminding me of what I did wrong. Instead, he welcomes me with open arms and loves me where I'm at despite what I did wrong. I obviously don't know your story, but God never changes, and his love and forgiveness is the same for everyone. You simply have to ask God for forgiveness and then accept it. It's really that easy. I'm not sure your background or if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, but I want you to know that he did. And he would do it again and again because he loves you that much. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. I also want you to know that if you're feeling like your life is over because you're sitting in jail and might be there for a while and you feel like you should just give up, you still have a purpose. God can use anything and anyone, and he still has a plan and purpose for your life. And he can still use you. In fact, it's people like you and I who sin that he uses the most. Our stories and the things we do, the trials we go through, shape and mold our lives. And he promises us that he will count it all for good and to never harm you, but to give you life and purpose. Jeremiah 20.11 For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, 
plans to give you a hope and a future. Pray that this will give you hope even a little bit. I know there are a lot of rumors going around and I choose not to believe them, but I read somewhere that you're depressed and not doing so good. I really can't imagine what you're going through as I've never been in your position, but I've been through some really bad depression and I can't imagine it's worse not being able to talk to anyone. Please don't let thoughts ruin or torment you, especially the people in there or out here. I can imagine it would be hard not to, but focus on what God thinks of you, how much he loves you. He desires to have a relationship with you, to know your heart. He thinks you are valuable, and he created you in his image. He cares for you. You are a gift. You have been justified and reclaimed, no longer a slave to sin. You will not be condemned by God. You have been set free. You are accepted and made new. You are chosen by him and predestined by him to obtain an inheritance in heaven, and he will supply you with all your needs. When you feel sad or depressed, focus on those things and remember who you are in him, because that's all that matters, and his opinion of you is the only one that matters. So a little about me. Since you have no idea who I am, I figured I would share my story and how I came to know Jesus. I'm 32 years old, and three years ago, I got into a drunk driving accident. I was the one driving, and it almost took my life. I woke up in the hospital and they told me they wanted to amputate my right leg because it was completely dead. I kept refusing, but they told me I would die from infection if I didn't get it amputated. Eventually, I signed the consent form to amputate and started praying that God would heal me. I went into the surgical room and came out six hours later and still had my leg. They were able to take a cadaver artery, and it miraculously worked. They eventually had to transfer me to a more experienced hospital where I stayed for two months and had over 20 surgeries on both of my legs in order to save them. After I was discharged from the hospital, I was bed-bound for six months, then wheelchair-bound for six months. It took me over a year to learn to walk again. I became very depressed, but through it all, God was there. The doctors were astounded by how well I healed. They have no clue how I'm here walking today because they told me I'd probably never be able to walk again. Even through the last three years, coming up to four in February, I've had some really rough times with severe chronic pain and depression, but somehow I was able to find strength through Jesus to get through the toughest times, and he's never let me down. I hope that you read this and it gives you hope and something to fight for. I'm going to end this letter here, but I will be praying for you in the meantime, and I would love to continue writing if you would like to. And if you choose to write back, please put attention Anna under the church address. And if you choose not to, just know I have hope for you, even if you don't have any for yourself. Keep fighting. God bless, Anna. I'm going to end it here for today. Leave your thoughts below. What made you cringe? Be sure to like and subscribe and join me next time for Letters from Ruby. She's your garden variety nut. She starts off with victim blaming, then sprinkles in a possible alien sighting, and moves on to talk of demons and being visited by angels sent down by God.